there's a, a movie called uh, 12 Years a Slave. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend that you watch it. Powerful, powerful movie. Um, it, it's around the time of, of the Civil War, and it's based around uh, one man. His name is, in the movie, Solomon Northup. And in the movie, during the time of the Civil War, he's a, a free black man living in that context. Now, every man, every woman is created free and created equally. I'm not saying that some men aren't, but in the movie, in that kind of context, um, in a time of slavery, you all know early American history, uh, he's a black man who's considered free, and he's living in the North. And so he's a free black man doing what a free man should do. He has his own family. He has his own house, just being a free man. Uh, one day, somehow, some way, he gets caught up, he gets kidnapped, and then he's basically sold into slavery. So this is a free black man now living as a slave. And it's just a horrendous picture. Slavery itself is horrendous, but this is a, a free black man who is now a slave. Now, um, incredibly frustrating, because slavery itself is frustrating, but to see how in his own political right, and whatever you want to call it, he's not supposed to be in that kind of context, and he's constantly telling these slaveholders and these masters, listen, I'm not a slave. And, and, and just, you can sense the frustration, you can sense the hurt and the pain, he's separated from his family, his family has no idea where he is. Um, and it just has these really powerful images that you see, and it conveys um, how we as people can be so depraved and lording ourselves over other people. But there's this one scene where he is about to be hanged, um, and they hang him, and he's actually being hanged for a good five to ten seconds. And uh, some guy rides in on a horse and orders them to put him down, um, but he, he's not let go. He's still in his noose, and he's just barely on his toes for hours just left there. And everyone is just walking past him like it's a normal thing, and he's hanging on for dear life. And finally, he's let down, and he's exhausted, and he's near death, and and, and, and his master walks by, and he, and he says, you must know that I'm not a slave. I'm a free man. And the guy simply looks at him, and he says, you are an exceptional slave. You are an exceptional slave, um, which is meant as a compliment, but it is the most degrading thing you could say to anybody. You are an exceptional slave. And so Solomon in the movie, um, he's a slave for 12 years. And the movie ends in such a powerful way. He finally gets freed, um, and he goes back to his family. And one of the last things that you see in the movie is he walks into his own home. After 12 years, his family has no idea where he's been. And they finally see him. And you just see the powerful... I don't even know what to call it, just this powerful scene where he's reunited with his family and he's a, a free black man, now made free again. Um, and, it's just, and it's so powerful. And you see, um, this story, the reason I share this is because this story in this movie is not just about slavery. Um, this story is about a free man in slavery. This story is about um, this man, some people would have just given up. Um, you're a free man sold in slavery and now maybe you've just given up you've lost hope you've lost a sense where I can be free again and so once that kind of sense settles in you um, you see your identity changes uh, you are not no longer a free man but now you are a slave and once the identity of slavery starts to set in you don't try to be free anymore you just try to make the best of your situation but this free man knowing that he's free fights for his identity fights for his freedom until one day he gets it. Now, as horrible as slavery can be, there is an even more powerful kind of slavery, and it is a spiritual slavery. And we've been talking about the gospel just hammering it in every week in Galatians, and Paul is not talking about gospel for gospel's sake. There's a power in the gospel, not just for a sense of future salvation, church. 
you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it's not just one day I'm going to heaven, I have a free ticket to heaven, and you just kind of wait around until that happens. But there is a present sense of the gospel working in you now. And so what text are we looking at today? Paul is saying now, yes, the gospel works in us now. We grow now, we're sanctified now, but there is freedom in that. Paul's explaining freedom, adoption, as, as sons and daughters of God, this is a living reality that we are to understand right now. And what, of, what I love about the text today is that Paul is now bringing up one of the most powerful results of being saved by the gospel. The gospel changes our identity from being spiritual slaves into adopted sons and daughters of God. We were spiritually enslaved now we are adopted sons and daughters of God. That is what we're looking at today. Go to chapter 4, verse 1. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians of, and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoptions as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Just stop there. So right off the bat, what we see is Paul is using a metaphor of a son and slave. And I'm going to make this point as simple and straightforward as I can. This is what the message is about today. You were once slaves, but now you are adopted children of God. You were once slaves, now you are adopted children of God. Okay? You could treat that as a thesis statement if you want. All I want to do is break that down into bite-sized pieces. That is my goal for today. And what I really want to do is help you understand, okay, I've been a Christian now for, for I think, 20 years, and I've been going to church my whole life, and, and I've heard this over and over again, and I'm saying that in a good way. I'm saying I've heard this over and over, that you are free from the law, you are no longer in spiritual slavery, you are adopted sons and daughters of God. I've been to countless youth retreats that have been about identity, identity in Christ, identity in, you know, in gospel, all these things, and I'm soaking it all, and it's And it's good. I've learned it, I've studied it, I've preached on it. You know what they say, if you really want to know something, you preach on it, because then you're really, really put to the test. But let me tell you something, I, I never, it never really sunk in, it never really started to come down to an, an, an eyesight level for me until someone, one of my pastor friends, sat me down and actually we started dialoguing about this. Um, I might as well just say this now because I might use this in the future. There's a gospel up here and there's a gospel down here. I don't know if you understand what I mean by that. The gospel up here is cognitive. It's theology. It is knowledge. It is facts and figures you learn. It's when Pastor Howard yells at you and you write it down. You have no idea what it means, but you nod and you act like you know what it is. That's the gospel up here. The gospel down here is when you actually see it playing out in your life. That's called conviction. That's called application. Whatever you want to call it. Both is needed. There's gospel up here, and there's gospel down here. When I'm talking now to my friend about what spiritual slavery is, he broke it down so that it was a gospel down here. It started to make sense. How do we make the gospel real? How do we make this idea that we have been in spiritual slavery and that we are now adopted children of God? How do we make that a reality? And so my friend asked me this question. What is the difference between an adopted child of God and a slave? What is the difference between an adopted son, an adopted daughter, and a slave? Think on that for a second. A slave labors, he works, he sweats and toils all day long. What does a son or daughter do? He or she sweats and works and toils all day long working for the Father. And so you look at that from a, from a, from a, a service level point of view, it's like there's no difference. There's no, 
I don't, I don't really see where you're going. It sounds the same to me. I mean, if we're going to bring the gospel down here, we're going to break it down in a very realistic way. There's kind of no difference. Well, let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever worked for your parents? Show of hands. Even if it was just for a day. Yeah. Some of you know what it's like working for your parents. And you would think, if you've never worked for your parents, you would think that maybe working for your parents just sounds like a dream job. You can kind of cruise through the day, do whatever you want, whenever you want. It is not true. You cannot be more wrong, okay? And, and, and if you've worked for your parents, you know exactly what I'm telling you. They'll treat you worse than a slave sometimes. That's just how it is, right? Um, you guys know Roy? Right? Yeah, Roy, right? So uh, smiles all day long, Roy Kim, okay? Uh, sorry, I don't mean to pick on Roy, but kind of. But uh, yeah, Roy, small. You know, if you ever want to evangelize in Compton, I dare you to take Roy. He will make the hardest gangster smile. Smiles all day. That's Roy, okay? I don't know if you knew this. Roy is my cousin. What? <laughs> Since when? Um, he's my cousin. Since birth. I don't know if you knew that. Um, uh, I'm not just saying that, really. He's my cousin. And so... Um, um, I share that with you because, uh, did you know his dad owns a liquor store and he was in a Kendrick Lamar music video? King Kunta. I guess Kendrick and I are homies now, family friends. But uh, uh, before his dad owned that liquor store in L.A., his dad and my dad and another uncle of ours, they used to work at the same liquor store in L.A. Uh, typical, right? We just can't escape Korean cliche, right? Koreans owning a small business liquor store in L.A. That's how it was. And I remember growing up in the liquor store, I remember always having candy. I don't even have sweet tooth, just candy. I just always had it. I remember Roy's dad, before Roy was non-existent, uh, Roy's dad would come over to our house, bring me a brown bag full of candy, lemon heads, Jolly Ranchers, just the good stuff. I was the kid that always showed up with all this exotic candy at school. I loved it because it made all the kids jealous. And, and so I remember those days, and I remember going to the liquor store with my dad, hanging out with my uncle, Roy's dad at the time, and, and, and just hanging out and eating all the candy I want and just checking out the liquor store. That's how it was. And one day, for some reason, my dad takes me to the liquor store, and it wasn't to hang out, it was to work. I don't know why. Maybe he was teaching me a lesson. Maybe he knew that I was going to speak on spiritual slavery as a pastor one day. I don't know but he puts me to work, and we visit warehouse after warehouse after Costco after warehouse, picking up cratefuls and boxes of cigarettes and liquor and candy and canned goods just over and over and over. And when you don't know when that's going to end, you feel like a slave. He doesn't care about my young, tender back. He doesn't care about how dirty and sweaty I am. Pick up the box put it in the van and let's go. We got to get this done. And because I'm his son, he will treat me. There's no rights. You know what I'm saying? I don't have, I'm not going to form, I'm not going to unionize against my dad. You know what I'm saying? What about benefits? You know, it's like, he's going to treat me however he wants. Now, now, was I even for a moment in time, for a, for a, a, a fleeting moment of time, was I ever a slave to my dad? Never. I was put to work, I toiled, I worked hard, I labored. I was never, ever a slave. My identity never changed. A slave, think about what a slave thinks about. Think about the worldview and mindset of a slave. Um, The, the world of a slave is very dark and it's very ugly. Um, I don't just mean in terms of um, the early American, you know, typical African American or African slave working in the fields picking cotton. That's a terrible, terrible time in American history, of course. But think about the ins and outs of the mindset of a slave. A slave uh, burns bridges, right? Relationally speaking, a slave burns bridges. He'll He'll abuse you. He'll do whatever he can to his fellow slave um, because relationships don't matter to a slave, right? Why don't relationships matter to slaves? Because it's all about surviving today. A slave is not concerned about what's going to happen five, ten years from now. A slave doesn't invest 
A slave doesn't care about education. A slave doesn't care about, about investing in the future and building up his future. Why? Because he has no future. A slave is only concerned about today. Therefore, what good are you to me? Well, if you can help me, right, make a better name for myself to the master so that I can get special treatment today, well, then I'm going to use you and abuse you, and when you're done, well, then you're no good to me. Burn the bridge, let him go. You see, we call that using people, right? We call that burning bridges. We call that, uh, what, what, you know, what, what good are you to me if you can't benefit me? Now, what does an adopted son do? What does an adopted daughter do? From the outskirts, it might look exactly the same. You serve, you work, you toil, but your identity does not change. And you know what the gospel says when your identity does not change? When I look at you, one brother or one sister to another, what's mine is yours. There is no, there is no I and there's no burning bridges. What's mine is yours and what's yours is mine. Do you know why? Do you remember in Luke 15 when the father goes to the older son and the older son is complaining, and the father's like, why aren't you in the party with your, old, with your younger brother? He's back home. He was lost, and he is found. Remember what the father says. All that is mine is yours. The father is not holding out the goods on his children. But what does a slave say? The worldview is completely different. A slave doesn't care about integrity, he doesn't care about working hard. He doesn't care about putting in an odd day's work. Why? Because if the boss is not there and if the master is not looking, who cares? I'm going to get mine. I'll use whatever, whatever people, whoever I need to do, who would use, and I'm going to get mine because it's all about today. A son cares about the integrity of the father. A son and daughter cares about representing the father well. The success of the father is the success of the adopted son and daughter. It is a completely different worldview. So what does this mean for a covenant community in terms of serving? Did you know, church, you're not here to serve me. You're here to serve the father. Go to verse 8. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not God's. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid I may have labored over you in vain. Paul is saying, you are going back to your old ways. My Old Testament professor said something that I may never forget. Um, and this captures what Paul is saying in the sense of spiritual slavery. My Old Testament professor said, it's easier to take a slave out of a slave context than it is to take a slave out of a slave mentality. Anybody can come swooping in and take a slave out of the context. But if a slave believes that he is a slave, it doesn't matter where he is he will believe that his identity is in slavery. I, I, I shared this before uh, uh, about my sister, and back when she's single, she's married now, and, and she has uh, twin daughters, but back when she was single, uh, she liked traveling with her friends. And, and I would tell her straight up, um, don't go, right? Um, and she's like, why? Because I'm looking at her, I'm like, you're gonna die. And she's looking at me and like, you're an idiot. I'm like, watch Taken. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay? You're going to die. It's a fact. Okay? Um, in my irrationality, I'm this annoying, protective little brother, right, trying to get my sister to understand what the, world, what the real world is like. She's like, you're an idiot. Okay? You're the one that's, like, sheltered. But anyways, okay, I'm looking at her, and I'm like, listen, that stuff is out there. And and, and I'm, I'm this little brother trying to protect her. And, and even though I'm being irrational, and I know I'm being irrational, it's true. Human trafficking is true. It happens. Um, and, and if you're not really sure what human trafficking is, it's more than just prostitution. You see, um, 
women will willingly go into prostitution, right? They'll sign up for it, basically. Human trafficking is basically mostly women, not always women, but mostly women, young girls a lot of the times, unwillingly forced into sex, sex labor. These are uh, young girls and women kidnapped. A lot of times they're drugged so that they, ha- they kind of lose their senses. They don't really know what they're doing, and they're forced into sexual slavery, right? And so if we're kind of blinded by that, and we kind of see that on news, you hear about it, and we turn our heads away as if we can't do anything about it, okay, that might be you, but if you actually sit on what happens, it is atrocious. And it happens. And, and maybe it hits home for you a little bit harder when I say it's not something that's happening only in third world countries. In fact, California is one of the most popular human trafficking states in America. Here's some stats for you. The average entry age of American minors into the sex trade is 12 to 14 years old. California harbors three of FBI's 13 highest child sex trafficking child sex trafficking areas in the nation. L.A., San Francisco, and San Diego. California by far has the most reported cases of human trafficking. Did you know Anaheim? Anaheim, which is right down the street, has the largest population of human trafficking. You drive by in a building in Anaheim, who knows what's in there. Four nationals are also brought into the U.S. as slaves for labor or commercial sex through force or fraud. The prevalence and anonymity of the internet has fueled the rapid growth of sex trafficking, making the trade of women and children easier than ever before. Those are just a few stats for you. And I'm not doing this, you know, just for for a shock factor. I, I want you to, in part, understand what is happening in the world in terms of modern slavery. And I know that we tend, again, to hear those things and act like it's not really out there. But you got to understand a lot of these girls, they're not from other countries. There are girls right around the corner, 12 to 14 years old. That's like youth kids from our youth group. I mean, youth girls from our youth group being kidnapped and then sold into sexual slavery. Um, it, 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 it boggles my mind. Now, here's what's crazy, and this is why I share this, okay? You think that with so many of these girls being kidnapped and trapped, that maybe some of them would try to figure out how to escape. You know, thousands and thousands of girls being kidnapped. You know, you would think that some of these girls would find a way to escape, you know, find the authorities and make it their way to freedom and, and, and everything is good for them, right? There are countless stories where these sex trade, the, these sex slavery owners, they would actually just leave the doors wide open. And, and these young girls, they would see the door wide open, and basically the guy is saying, if you want to leave, you can leave. And what boggles my mind is that many of these girls do not leave. It is easier to take a slave out of the slavery context than it is to take a slave out of the mentality of slavery. Do you know why a lot of these girls won't leave? Because freedom is scary. You just don't know what's out there. It is unpredictable. It is not, it's unfamiliar. It's uncomfortable. You leave the door wide open for freedom and you're going to choose slavery. Why? Because you just don't know. I mean, it's ridiculous. And, and, and I'm not minimizing the atrocity of, of human trafficking, but on a spiritual level, my question for you is that Is that us? That we're stuck in spiritual slavery and Jesus is opening the door wide open for us, but we're saying, I'd rather just sit here and be comfortable. Is that something we go through? That we understand we're born as sinners and we're born into slavery, and because we're born into slavery, we just don't know anything else. And so we say, well, this life isn't so bad, but you actually look at the reality of what it is, and then it's atrocious. It's easier to take a slave out of a slave context than it is to take a slave out of a slave mentality. And Paul says in verse 9, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary princes of the world 
whose slaves you want to be once more. What is Paul saying? Don't just talk about the gospel up here and don't just talk about freedom up here. Be free. Don't just think that you have a mentality of freedom without actually practicing in real life what freedom is. And do you believe that when the gospel says, yes, Jesus died on the cross for our sins, and yes, I'm going to heaven, but I'm still stuck in this, in this present reality and current situation now, and I just have to ride it out. Is that really what Jesus has died for? Paul is saying, you're going back. You're going back. I have opened the door for you. I have freed you. And you're sitting there and going back to the spiritual slavery. Paul is saying, get out of that. Paul is saying that if we are actually free and we're actually adopted sons and daughters of God, then let's practice it. So church, how do we practice that? How do you get a young 14-year-old goal, girl to step out of the doors of freedom? And, and how do you convince her that, that freedom is so much better than your current reality now? How do you speak to the Christian who's been going to church his or her entire life and, and he's heard thousands and, and, and thousands of sermons and Bible studies on spiritual freedom but doesn't know what that actually looks like. And so they are stuck in legalism and they are stuck in pharisaical living and they are stuck in law and they are stuck in guilt and shame. Is that something we do? We leave church and we just do something? We read a Bible verse, we meditate on it and something is fixed? church, it's not something we do, which I understand doing is good. I'm not saying doing is something we don't want to do. Doing is good. But could it be that real transformation and real change, real spiritual formation starts with perspective? Could it be that taking the gospel up here in the head, that we need to apply that in such a way where the gospel starts to make sense to our hearts? Church, what does it take for a heart change? What does it take? I'm not talking about inspiration. I'm not talking about motivation. I'm talking about a real heart change to the extent where now your perspectives have changed. Your volition, your worldview, your whole value system has now changed. You see, a truth needs to take a hold of your heart. A truth needs to sink deep down into what you believe is true and good. And it will change the trajectory of your behavior. You see, that's what we call gospel-centered change. That's what we call transformation, not just inspiration. What does it take for our hearts to be changed? Change starts with belief. It starts with identity. It starts with a, a transformation in perspective. Church, do we have a source that empowers us to live as freely adopted children of God. When you look at the Bible cover to cover, what is it about? Let, let, let's kind of shy away from this language of, oh, well, Jesus died for our sins, I'm going to heaven. Absolutely true, absolutely powerful, but cover to cover. Genesis to Revelation, what is a constant theme that you're going you're gonna to see constantly over and over? It is about God delivering his people from slavery. It's in the Old Testament, and it's in the New Testament, right? The most powerful narrative for, for modern Jews is when they look at how God delivered them in crossing the Red Sea and into the wilderness. Physical slavery from Pharaoh into physical freedom in the wilderness. Every narrative, every passage, every verse about freedom, about deliverance from slavery, you're going to find that all over the Bible. Where does that all lead us to? What, what is the climax of the entire Bible? You look at the huge overarching theme of what the Bible is actually about, and what do you see? That there is someone who not only took our slavery, but became the slave that we were supposed to be. And if you sit on that church and you realize that God sent his son Jesus to take our place of slavery, let me explain something to you. He didn't have to. Okay, just spend a moment thinking about the political climate from this past week. America, the land of the free. America, the land of opportunity. 
And here we are, the most entitled people on the planet with the most resources, the best education, and best of everything, and here we are complaining about something that, that we think we deserve, and we complain, and we fight, and we protest over and over and over again. And you look at the world, and what do you, what do you conclude? Something is jacked up in this world. I mean, democracy, American democracy, is supposed to be the best form of government, but it sucks. There's nothing we can do to improve on that. And we're trying to get better, but we look at the world in reality as something is wrong. You don't even have to be Christian to understand that. You look at the world and you see something is wrong. You can shift the blame. You can blame politicians. You can blame the church. You can blame whoever you want. But the reality is we deserve spiritual slavery. That is the, that is the result of our own works. Not Jesus. Jesus came to us. Jesus didn't have to come to us, but he came to us, meddled and lived amongst sinners, amongst immortal, amongst, amongst depraved people, only to die for depraved people. And for what? I don't know. But you see, there's a beautiful exchange that happens, and that just idiotic and, and atrocious picture of the gospel that, that doesn't make any sense to us is a beautiful and deep exchange that when we actually sit on and understand church it changes and transforms our heart which then leads to actual functional freedom as adopted sons and daughters of God the gospel changes our hearts now Let me break that down even more. And um, something that I've been wanting to do as we're going through Galatians is to help you understand the reality of the current power of the gospel. And so let's not just talk about how we're going to just live for the rest of our lives, okay? Let's not focus on 10 years, 5 years from now. Let's just focus on what we're going to do this week. Let's focus on what we're going to do tomorrow. Okay, I'm not saying that the gospel doesn't have uh, uh, long-term repercussions and effects. I'm talking about just what, what is the mentality, what is the worldview, what transformation do we want to see tomorrow? Once in a while, someone asks me um, about my life as a pastor. Um, and it's always, no matter what, I always laugh on the inside, but I want to be nice, so I don't laugh on the outside. And so I'm like, interesting question, but I'm LOLing inside. Uh, but people ask me, what, what do you do during the week? Why is it so hard? You know, why do pastors have to act like their life is so tough and they're always tired and they're always struggling? Well, let me tell you, okay? To a certain extent, I understand that if you don't know, because all you really see, if you don't know, all you really see is a pastor that comes up and preaches for 40 minutes. And you think, oh, it must be nice to work one day a week, right? So to this extent, I can understand. Um, and if you're like, well, how hard is it to preach a sermon? Trust me, it's hard. <laughs> it's not funny. It's hard. Um, preaching a sermon is hard. Um, some of you will give me um, a hard time, like I'm talking like the dirtiest looks ever, when I ask you to pray for a meal in front of people. Um, you can't pray in front of people for 30 seconds. Imagine speaking in front of people for 40 minutes. Okay? That alone, okay, is hard. Um, but preaching a sermon, preaching one sermon is hard, okay? And, and, the, and the reality is, um, if you're not, the only way you're going to understand how difficult it is, is is if you actually preach a sermon. But the reality is, if you're not called to preach and you're not called to be a pastor, then you're never going to preach a sermon, and therefore you're never really going to understand how hard it is, okay? So with that said, preaching one sermon is hard. Preaching every week is really hard. You just preached, for example, the worst sermon of your life. Guess what? You have to preach again next week. A family member has passed away in your family. You were close to that person and you are in mourning. Guess what? You have to preach again next week. You sprained an ankle, you have mad diarrhea or gas, you broke up with a boyfriend or girlfriend and you're heartbroken, guess what? You have to preach again next week. 
because a pastor cannot call the church one morning and say, service is canceled. Right? And no matter what, the congregation is going to come and they're going to expect greatness. They're going to expect a well uh, scripted sermon. Well, because it's God. No matter what happens, you have to preach week in and week out. That's the difficulty, church. Um, and so the battle is um, Saturday night, Sunday morning, when we have to realize that it doesn't matter where we are physically, it doesn't matter where we are spiritually, emotionally, financially, or relationally, we have to preach. And we want to preach well. And and so let me say this, okay. Um, Archibald Hart, you have no idea who he is. Um, he was the former dean of the School of Psychology at Fuller Seminary. And so coming from a counseling point of view, he said that surviving the ministry is a matter of surviving depression. Surviving the ministry isn't getting your numbers up on a Sunday attendance. It's about depression. That's what it comes down to because you preach every week every year for years and years and years all for what to find out that you come Sunday and people want to sleep and you got to do it again and again and again and if you're like I just don't get it it just doesn't seem all that hard here's some stats for you 90% of pastors I'm not making this up 90% of the pastors said the ministry was completely different than what they thought it would be like before they entered the ministry 80% of pastors feel unqualified and discouraged in the role as pastor. 70% say they have a lower self-image now than when they first started. 70% do not have someone they consider a close friend. Because who's friends with the pastor at their church? Why be his friend? He's the pastor. 70% of pastors feel grossly underpaid. 70% of pastors constantly fight depression. 70% of pastors constantly fight depression. Do you know why that's hard to see? Because a pastor doesn't come up on Sunday and say, I'm fighting depression. A pastor comes up, espouses the text, says hello, shakes your hand, let me pray for you. Oh, that must be tough. Let me encourage you. And he comes Monday morning defeated. So I'm not sharing this so you can throw a pity party, you know, for me and Pastor Josh, Pastor Han. And that's not why I'm sharing this. I'm sharing this with you because it doesn't matter if you're called to be pastors or preachers. Everybody needs the gospel. I need the gospel just as much as you, if anything more so. And so what do we as pastors tell ourselves? Today, today, Sunday morning, today, am I going to preach today as a slave or am I going to preach today as an adopted son of God? That is where the battle lies. We have options. Am I going to preach today as a slave in guilt and shame and discouragement and defeat, constantly trying to earn the approval of the master? Or am I going to preach today as a freely adopted son of God who already loves me? And Paul says we go to God and say, Abba, Father, not Master, not Slaveholder. A gospel of slavery says if you don't preach the best sermon of your life, you have failed. In fact, you're already a failure. Why preach? Why not just quit and make it easier for yourselves? A gospel of adoption says if you don't preach the best sermon of your life, your Father already loves you. Be sustained in the love of the Father. Your validity as a pastor isn't determined by how much response you get, how many likes you get from your congregation. It is sustained by the Father. Church, what gospel will you live in tomorrow? I'm not talking about 5, 10, 20 years from now. I'm talking about Monday morning, or for some of you, Monday afternoon when you get up out of bed, what gospel will you live in? A gospel of slavery or a gospel of adoption? You have a choice. And you fight the temptation. You know what lies ahead of you. And you can ask yourself, am I going to be a student today under the banner of slavery or under the banner of freedom and adoption? 
Am I going to go to work today as an employee with guilt and shame and frustration and exhaustion? Or am I going to go to work today with a sense of joy and with a sense of gladness? Because the Father already loves me. There's nothing I can do to make the Father love me more. And how do I know? The Father says, all that is mine is yours. How will you end your day as a slave? You wake up Monday morning, you go to bed Monday night. How will you end your day? You will be exhausted as a slave, you will be frustrated as a slave, and you will be hopeless as a slave. And do you know why? Because you're going to go to God and you're going to end your day saying, please forgive me. Please spare me. Please show me mercy. That is the worldview of a slave. But if you end your day as an adopted child, yes, you will be exhausted. Yes, you will have toiled and you have worked hard, but you will be rested. And your heart will be full. Because at the end of the day, you can approach not your master, but your father. And you approach him with joy, you approach him with freedom, and you say, Father, you say, Dad, you say, Abba, you say, Abba, Father, you have already loved me. You have already given everything for me. You have already spared me. You have already shown me mercy. Thank you. You have options, church. Will you live in the gospel of slavery? Will you live in the gospel of adoption? Let's live in victory. Let's live in freedom. Let's not just say we know freedom, but let's practice it. Let's heed to what Paul says when he says, why are you going back to slavery? It just doesn't make sense. May that be your week this week. Join me in prayer.